next we're going to talk about the third school of temperamental theory and that is the bus employment approach and so with david bus and robert plowman we're really talking more about the biology of temperament but we're getting even further into the biology to such a specific extent we're talking about the genetics and even at the molecular genetic level now they believed in four different dimensions of temperament i'm not going to go into them in a lot of detail because i feel like they've been thoroughly explained uh, through the rothbard and thomas and chess approaches there were emotionality which overlaps with negative affectivity or intensity or reactivity affect uh, there is activity as well as sociability which overlaps with rothbard's theory of surgency and there was impulsivity which is described a bit different than we've seen before because it's really described as the inverse or the lack of persistence or effortful control and so although there's some similarities here in the dimensions, what really makes this school of thought stand out is the applications to genetics, to differential susceptibility, and to epigenetics. And the bus employment approach to temperament allowed us to start to connect temperamental traits to exact genes. The DRD4 gene, which associates with novelty seeking and impulsivity. We can see the DRD4 gene sort of links to what we know as the behavioral activation system. The idea that those who have um, more activity in their pleasure circuit of their brain, and they may be more impulsive and more goal driven towards good things. There's also the 5-HTT-LPR, which is associated with harm avoidance or negative emotionality. And so these individuals, they may have more uh, activity in what we call the biz circuits or the behavioral inhibition system, the fear circuit or the panic circuit. We can see how these individuals may be higher in negative affectivity or in negative in emotionality. They're less impulsive. Uh, they're more withdrawn and worried about the negative things that are going to happen. Now, of course, this depends if you have the long form or short form of these genes, and you could have the combination of both or neither or what have you. Uh, so it's important to understand. Other genetic implications that the bus employment theory brought us to were such things as the gene by environment interaction theory. And this is the idea that children and babies and teens and even adults, uh, they make passive, evocative and active interactions with their environment all the time. A passive interaction is the idea of an outgoing child with an outgoing family. It just sort of clicks. Uh, an evocative interaction is an outgoing child who evokes and, and it just evokes outgoingness and sociability in others just by being around them. And an active interaction is the idea that an outgoing person has to take on that more active role to transform their environment and make their environment more fitting of their temperament. Now, all of us do this, whether you're dominant and outgoing or if you're submissive and quiet, being more quiet can make people more quiet and restrained around you as well. Finally, uh, genetics do not just influence how you interact with your environment, but also how you perceive your environment. And this is the idea that two individuals will perceive the same context, the same activity or the same event in a very different way. There's no objective reality. It's, it's all perceptive. And it's the idea that a person who's high in sociability or low in sociability will view a social environment as more or less threatening. That a person who is more emotional or less emotional will remember an event very differently. And so how temperament plays a role in our context really lends into Belsky's theory of differential susceptibility. And so this is the idea that uh, we are not just vulnerable to negative risks of our context, but we're also more susceptible to the positive outcomes of our environment. So some people are more resilient. They just don't get impacted by their context as much. Of course, a, a positive atmosphere is going to be more positive for them and a negative one's going to be more negative, but not as compared to others. We tend to find that some individuals really benefit from a positive environment and are really at risk or at the detriment of a negative environment. There's just some people that are much more influenced or sensitive to their environment, and there's some people that are less sensitive to their environment. And so if we think about the family that is much more sarcastic or cynical um, and a family that is much more mushy and emotional, some kids are just going to be who they are regardless who they're around. They're not going to be more cynical or less or more mushy or less around people. They're just going to be themselves. Versus other people, when they're around sarcastic people, be also become much more sarcastic. Or when they're around mushy people, become well, a lot more sentimental and mushy. And so we could really see how some of us are much more influenced by our environment than others. And speaking of how our environment can influence us, now we're going to talk about epigenetics. And so one of the ways I like to think about differential susceptibility is in a learning atmosphere. 
Of course, all kids are going to benefit from, from a positive atmosphere and all kids are going to uh, suffer when there's a negative learning environment, but some kids suffer or benefit less. They're, they're much more stable relative to others. And some kids really benefit or fall behind drastically based on the environment. Some kids, yeah, if, they, if things are harsh or critical or what have you, they really withdraw. And so, but those same kids, if things are really comforting, they really come out of their shell and they really benefit. Now the last component of the bus employment theory is the epigenetics component. And this is the idea that our environment can shape us all the way down to our genes. And that is our environment will influence the expression of some of our genes or the methylization of our DNA, the activation of some of our traits. And so most of this research is done on non-human animals, but a few examples I want to bring up um, are that include what happens when we undergo a lot of stress. You now know that when a parent is pregnant and they experience a major depressive episode, uh, this doesn't just increase the stress hormone and that hormone increases more exposure to stress hormone in their infant. It also unlocks and methylizes the glucocorticoid receptor gene in newborns. And so it's not just that the babies are exposed to more stress hormone in the womb, it's that the exposure to stress hormone in the womb unlocks and activates the glucocorticoid receptors in the baby, which makes the babies produce more corticosteroids or more cortisol or more stress hormone. The baby wasn't just exposed to more stress hormone, they're now going to produce more stress hormone themselves. And babies who were exposed to more stress in their newborn state, controlling for what happened in the prenatal state, when they're exposed to more stress in the newborn state, as adolescents, they will have more methylization in the numerous different receptor sites in their brain. So this continues on in a bit of a domino fashion, showing how our environment doesn't just influence us at a learning level, it influences us at a biological level as well. And so that was the bus employment theory of temperament. Next up, we just have a quick one with the goldsmith theory of temperament.